Hello, and welcome to a lecture on the H-plane sectoral horn. I'm Steve Ellingson. First, an overview of this lecture. First, I'll provide you an introduction to horn antennas. Then, we'll talk specifically about the H-plane sectoral horn. We'll talk about the aperture field of an H-plane sectoral horn. We'll talk about the radiated field. We'll talk about the pattern, the directivity, design strategy for the H-plane sectoral horn. And then we'll wrap it up with some concluding remarks. So first, the main idea of a horn antenna. Well, directivity requires aperture. So in order to achieve higher directivity, you need larger aperture. Now we know that a waveguide can be used as an antenna. In other words, you can have a waveguide that simply ends and it will radiate, and in that sense it can be an antenna. But the directivity of such an antenna is low because it has small aperture. So flare it out. And here's the idea. Over here you have waveguide, and then the flare. So simply attach a flared section to a waveguide to expand the available aperture. So in this case, we're going from a dimension of little a to big A. And these are variables that I will continue to use throughout the lecture. Now the problem with doing this is non-uniform phase in the aperture. And the issue is this. Optimum directivity comes from a uniform aperture. To get the best possible directivity out of an aperture, we know that we would like uniform phase, constant phase over the aperture. But that's not what you get necessarily when you flare the waveguide. So here, let me quantify what's going to happen. Uh, this dimension here, I'll call L sub H. And this dimension here, I'll call R sub 1. And these two variables are defined in such a way so that they define a right triangle that coincides with the flare of the horn. Now magnitude and phase varies because this distance L sub H is different from R sub 1. So the desire for a large aperture and a uniform distribution leads you to make the horn as long as possible. In other words, to make R sub 1 as big as you can accommodate. So this brings us to the idea or the notion of length constrained design. So a typical starting point horn design is to choose the length R1 that uh, is as big as you can tolerate. And then the next decision is this flare angle alpha sub H, which I've indicated here, which is one of the angles in this right triangle that I pointed out earlier. Now, if the angle's too small, then we'll have a small aperture, which is not good for directivity. But if alpha sub h is too large, then we expect to see phase cancellation and reduction in directivity through that mechanism. So for example, if we kind of get it right, maybe we see something like that looks like this, where this is phase, right? And then this is distance along the aperture. And then if we push it a little bit more, we'll have a larger phase variation. But then if we push it too far, we might have phase which varies uh, between uh, positive and negative over the aperture. And that wouldn't be good because sections of the aperture here would be in phase cancellation with sections of the aperture having the opposite sign. So that's clearly going too far. So we see a trade-off here. If alpha is too small, we don't get enough directivity because the aperture is too small. If alpha sub h is too big, we lose directivity through this phase cancellation mechanism. And just to be clear here, these three different figures are aperture phase with increasing alpha h. So relatively low alpha h, intermediate alpha h, and then large alpha h. So, as it says here, for any given length, there is an optimum flare angle. Or you could say it differently, there's an optimum aperture dimension for any given specified flare angle. 
Now, let's talk about a particular kind of horn, which is the main topic of this lecture, the H-plane sectoral horn. It looks just like the way we described it uh, in this dimension. So we have a waveguide. Uh, it has dimension A, at least in this plane. And then the geometry we, all just, we talked about is all in play here. In the other dimension, if we rotate this 90 degrees, then the other dimension of the waveguide is B. It's a rectangular waveguide. And we continue that dimension B throughout the length of the horn. So we define this one other variable here, R sub H, and note the coordinate system. I've attached a coordinate system in the center of the aperture. Z is broadside, and then X in this plane, and then Y in this plane. So if I were to illuminate the aperture in this particular structure, a logical way to go would be to use the TE01 mode. In the TE01 mode, the electric field, which is arriving from over here somewhere, is polarized in the plus y direction. And internal to the waveguide, it's a plane wave propagating towards the aperture of the horn. And here's a perfectly reasonable expression for that uh, instant field. That is the excitation for this structure. Y hat polarized, some complex constant describing magnitude and phase. And then we know that we must have a cosine pi x over a magnitude variation in order to satisfy boundary conditions. So the electric field has to be zero on this wall, has to be zero on this wall, and it goes to a maximum in the center. So this is what we're calling an H-plane sectoral horn. We call it an H-plane sectoral horn for reasons you can probably now see. If the electric field looks like this in the aperture, then this will be the E-plane. And if the electric field looks like this up here in the aperture, then this will be the H-plane. So since the flare is in the H-plane, we refer to this as an H-plane sectoral horn.